Hello, my name is Professor Kath Nix from the University of Leeds and I'm also a fellow of IMEC -E. and this short presentation is to just give you an insight into what we know about the transmission of COVID-19 and the role in which engineering plays in mitigating the risk of, of the disease. So what we have learned so far about COVID-19 is it is um, it's a respiratory virus. It's actually caused by a virus called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it's contained within people's exhalations. So when you breathe, you talk, you cough, you sing, you produce particles, and those particles um, will contain virus. And these particles range across multitude of different sizes, from less than one micrometer in size, up to potentially some as big as a millimeter in size. Um, there are many, many more smaller ones than there are larger ones. And these particles then um, enable uh, up to three different routes of transmission. So they can be very small aerosols, uh, which are carried uh, uh, beyond two metres in a shared room, particularly if the ventilation is poor, and can be inhaled. Then much of the transmission is thought to happen when people are close together, and that's a mixture of very small aerosols, larger aerosols, and even some large droplets, which can be both inspired or could uh, deposit on the eyes, nose and mouth to cause infection. And it's very difficult to separate that transmission route out. And then a third transmission route, which is via surfaces. So larger droplets or virus that's on people's hands from, let's say they've coughed on their hand, for example, can be passed on through actually direct contact with hands or through touching surfaces that are contaminated and then touching the eyes or the nose or, or putting fingers in the mouth. And these three different routes potentially can um, pass on the, the virus. We know that there are a number of risk factors that from uh, the evidence so far that influences transmission. So we know that proximity is a key risk factor. The closer you are to somebody, and if you particularly if you're face to face with them, you increase the risk that you directly inhale some of their exhalations. We know that risk is considerably higher indoors and increases with poorer ventilation. There is very little evidence that transmission happens um, regularly outdoors. That's not to say there is no risk, but it's to say that actually you really have to be close to somebody who's infected outdoors for there to be a risk. The outdoor risk is, is pretty low on the whole. We know that the longer the time you spend with somebody infectious, the more the risk is that the disease is passed on. And for example, household transmission is particularly high because you're spending an awful lot of time in the same shared space. We know from some of the outbreak evidence that there are activities such as, for example, singing or loud speaking or where you're doing high aerobic activity. These can both increase the emission rate of particles, which is likely to be increasing the emission rate of virus, but also it means you breathe more deeply, so you might inhale more particles. We know that crowded spaces are more risky, so there will be a, the more people there are in a space, the higher the chance that somebody infectious is in that space, but also the more people that virus could be passed on to. And then we know, particularly from laboratory studies, that the environmental conditions matter. So the virus prefers cooler temperatures. It prefers lower humidity. So when it's below about 40 percent relative humidity, the survival is longer. And we also know that it, it, it survives better on surfaces in air, air in indoor type environments, which tend to be darker compared to, for example, outdoors in the midday sun in the summer when the virus survival is much, much lower. And then the symptoms make it difficult. So um, we do know that asymptomatic transmission can happen. A lot of the asymptomatic transmission is probably what we call pre-symptomatic, so happens before people show symptoms. But this does mean it's very hard to detect people who are infectious, and you, may, you don't necessarily have to have a cough or a fever to be infectious and pass the virus on. How do we find out how transmission happens? And it's actually very tricky. We have to make, we have to collect evidence from a range of different studies, from uh, outbreak studies, from the population level epidemiology, from um, cohort studies, and then from animal studies and laboratory experiments, as well as some looking at the basic physics. But from what we know so far, we know that the importance of the different transmission routes are unclear. We know from animal studies that both airborne and surface transmission is possible. Um, we do know that the risk is highest when you're in close proximity. 
Um, it does seem that although surfaces do pose a risk, the kind of random surfaces, so touching a package in a supermarket or the parcels that get delivered to your home, there doesn't seem to be really very much evidence that that is a transmission route. It, it very much seems that you have to be in the space with the infector or very shortly afterwards for it to really pose a significant risk. We also know that super spreading happens. Um, it's quite likely that airborne transmission plays a part when super spreading does happen, but we don't know how often super spreading happens. Um, and we do know that this disease is what we call very over dispersed. So um, there are some people who pass it on very effectively and others who barely um, uh, who just don't pass it on at all. And I've already mentioned that the evidence for outdoor transmission is is very weak. There are very few cases which have been identified which have happened outdoors and where they have it's people have been in close conversation. What we also know is that although it's tempting to say that certain settings might be more risky, you know, you might say the hospital's more risky or a school's more risky or an office is more risky. We've learned that a transmission can happen basically anywhere where you put people together. It's very difficult to unpick what's going on. At population scale, the data is too, is not granular enough to, for us to work that out. But we have identified, as I've already mentioned, some risk factors that make certain settings more risky. So, for example, if people are in an environment which is enclosed, poorly ventilated, they're not wearing face coverings and they're talking loudly, those risk factors all add up. And we also know that transmission is not always what it seems. So it, you see this particular with workplace outbreaks, the uh, outbreak is associated to a workplace, but actually it may not happen within the workplace itself. It may well happen um, because uh, people share transport together, they socialize together, they share houses together. Um, so there's often a lot of associated transmission, particularly in close knit communities where the community and the workplaces are very close to tied together and that's a particular challenge as well with schools and does it happen in school or associated with school in the local community. Looking at the physics of transmission when we breathe out these respiratory droplets and aerosols when you're closest to somebody they are in the highest concentration you will be exposed to all those different sizes of particles and aerosols the biggest ones are ballistic and they will drop out very quickly onto surfaces the smallest ones can stay in the air for longer and as you go further away it's a concentration type problem you move further away and you're exposed to less and eventually with you are exposed to only the smallest particles which tend to be the most dilute in a space. So we need to think through this there's a fluid dynamics physics perspective to how this virus works. We also know some things about particle sizes and I know I'm talking men, to engineers here who will appreciate some of the, the, the sizing of aerosols and droplets in here but when we look at um, how particles deposit in the air we can start to think about what happens. So the graph on the left hand side shows in the blue line um, the, the falling time for particles of different sizes to drop. And what you can see is very small particles will sustain the air for a long period of time. But our 20 micron particle takes maybe three minutes to fall and a 50 micron particle would take, say, 30 seconds to fall. But that assumes still air and in our real buildings, air is not still. Um, and in fact, the red curve shows the falling velocities of those particles. Now, if we consider that air velocities in a room are typically between about 0 0.02 and 0 0.1 meters per second, you can rapidly see that those falling velocities are comparable to the velocities of the, uh, uh, of the air in the room. And so they are going to be influenced quite heavily by the airflow in the room. So simply just saying how long does it take for a particle to drop out is not going to be as, uh, give us enough information. We also know from exposure science as well that the sizes of particles we can breathe in matter. So um, the very smallest particles, the ones we call the respirable convention, are those which can get to the very deep lung. Um, and so you know, that's why we worry about, for example, PM 2.5 particles with pollution. From a, um, but we actually can see that we can inhale particles all the way up to about 100 microns. And these much larger ones will deposit in the upper airways, in your nose, the back of your throat in your in your mouth. Um, so with this disease, we actually have to worry about all of these particle sizes because we believe that they can all carry virus so they could expose you. So it's not just the biggest ones. It's not just the smallest ones. It's the whole range.
<coughs> we have some environmental evidence for the virus. We can see from um, laboratory studies and some of the graphs on the right show survival of virus in aerosol from laboratory studies. But we know that it's stable on indoor surfaces and in air. And that's enabled studies to look at some of the basic parameters like temperature, humidity and UV index. In the real world, though, it's a bit harder to find this evidence. So there are a number of studies that have sampled surfaces and they found RNA in many of them. A very small number have found live virus and several studies have sampled hospital air. And that's a little bit patchy. Sometimes it's found, sometimes it's not. Um, again, it tends to be in quite small amounts and um, but there's tends to be RNA. There's only maybe two studies that have actually found any cultured live virus from the air. What that tells us is that it is actually quite hard to find this virus. And when we start thinking about it, you know, if something's in the air, it's really only going to be there when the infected person is present and then it will get quite quickly ventilated away. So it's not as straightforward as we can simply sample and look for it. We actually have to try and use this evidence as part of trying to unpick where things are rather than a really core mechanism for finding where the virus is. The other thing that I think is really important to mention is COVID is not a disease which is, um, uh, it doesn't affect people equally. There are huge inequalities in it, not just COVID itself, but actually air quality, which is quite highly linked in some respects to the environments that we live in. But the disease, um, as you can see on the graph on the right, um, which is the cases uh, per 100,000, um, those in the most deprived quintile um, are um, considerably more likely to be infected than those in the least deprived. And this is influenced by multiple factors. So your geographic location, um, the housing you live in, the, those, uh, those who are the, in the most deprived uh, communities tend to have the poorest quality housing, tend to be the highest, most crowded housing. They also tend to have the lowest income and the jobs which actually not only pay the least, but probably put them at the greatest risk of exposure. Um, and also are more likely to have to use shared transport of some description, um, are least likely to have the education to be able to um, take on board the right um, controls and mechanisms, and are also more likely to have um, other underlying health conditions that make people more susceptible to the disease. So in thinking about how we manage this disease, which is really important that inequalities come into that conversation too. And that's right across both the public environments, home environments and workplace environments. When we think about controlling the disease, um, uh, uh, the hierarchy of risk controls, which many of you will be familiar with, is a, a key strategy for how to manage our environments. And as we know that the, those, those at the top of the pyramid are the most effective. So simply actually stopping work activities with closed sectors, whole sectors, for example, um, are a way of preventing transmission to happen. We know that that's not sustainable long term and we have to think of alternatives. Um, substitution is our next one. So thinking about how we, you know, where we can work from home if we can, using different transport modes if we can, thinking even just simple things about how we cohort workers so that groups never come into contact with each other. And then the main one that I think IMACE members will be playing a big role in are the engineering controls. So a key one here is ventilation, but also things like screens and barriers, air cleaning technologies, surface technologies, and even how we just physically lay out the built environment. As we go further down the pyramid, the actions become more dependent on behaviour to be effective and are therefore less, I won't say less effective, but they are uh, less controllable in an environment. And the bottom of the list is always personal protective equipment. Um, now, with this disease, we, we have reached a, a point where we have not much choice but to use some form of face coverings. Um, interestingly, possibly they are also an engineering control to some extent too as a source control, but they are very much a personal thing um, and we are in a position of last resort. But if we start thinking about how environments should be resilient, then we really need the engineering in place first to enable us to reduce our dependence on some of these other controls.
If we think of then about just to follow on from that, how we might order technologies. So any form of technology which can reduce the source of the pathogen is the best we can do. If it's not there at all, then there is no transmission. So thinking about reducing the number of people in spaces, reducing the duration of time people spend in the space and using technologies to control the source like face coverings. Distancing, keeping people further apart is going to reduce people's exposure to the highest concentration of virus. And then when we start thinking about adding in other technologies, ventilation is more important than are there other technology solutions, for example, like air cleaning, because it's necessary beyond COVID. And we put that respiratory protection at the bottom of the list, even though we may have to do it. We should, we should go through the, the order first before we get to that one. We also have to think about how our mitigations match the transmission routes. Um, and this is quite a messy diagram, but it just shows the, um, the complexity of how we can use those different mitigation measures. We can also, if you look, some of the mitigation measures are on the left hand side and some are on the right. So some things are about preventing the infected person from disseminating the virus into the environment. Others are about preventing susceptible people being exposed to it. And we have to make sure we cover all our bases here. So it's no good just having a really effective hand cleaning and surface sanitation strategy because all you've done is dealt with the bottom half of the diagram. You've not missed all of the aerosols. So we have to do all of these different measures. From an engineering perspective, I think there is an awful lot which we can do and an awful lot of these things we've already been working on this year. So engineers have been working around face coverings, masks and other respiratory protection. It is a personal approach, but essentially there's engineering design in there uh, as a key part and testing um, to, to make sure that these, these technologies work effectively. And even things like decontamination of such uh, protective equipment is, is a really key part of the engineering response. Ventilation is probably the best known one of the engineering response. It is the backbone of how we control aerosols, but we also know that it, it actually affects energy, comfort and indoor air quality too. And there are considerable challenges with that at the moment. We are not being able to manage the trade-offs effectively in many buildings. We know that engineers have been involved with layouting buildings, redesigning the buildings, installation of things like screen and barriers. That's a really interesting mitigation. It's they're very widespread. I'm sure some of you will have identified there are some good ones and some appalling ones out there. And I think the design of these actually matters very much. We don't have very much evidence of how effective they are, but they can affect airflows as well as block blocking droplets. I think there is a, going to be a greater call in the future for, for some surface technologies in certain places, um, but we need to be quite careful and think about which surfaces do we put this on and what's the speed of the action. It's no good having a surface technology that kills a virus in half an hour if people touch it after two minutes. So and then I think we we are uh, getting to a stage where air cleaning technologies are going to be coming more and more wide to be used. Um, again, these mainly target an airborne route and the choice and design of the technology here is really important. There are a whole raft of different technologies out there. Some are far more effective than others and some potentially have secondary issues. So they may generate, for example, ozone or ultrafine particles, which are themselves a respiratory pollutant. So we need to be careful we don't take one problem away and create another problem in its place. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that the engineering role in controlling COVID actually is all of the support to the systems and strategies. So all of those systems to enable testing, tracing, management of spaces and the back end around the labs and logistics. It's a huge amount of an engineering response in there, which often gets overlooked. But many of these things would not happen without the engineering response to support it. So I think many of you will be looking at technologies, looking at how we can intervene from an engineering perspective. And, you know, these are my sort of top tips for this, thinking about what is it actually mitigating and can it do it effectively? What do you need to invest to do it? Do you need specialist design? Is it going to cost you a lot of money? And then even if you've got some technology in, what are you going to need to do to use that technology? Is it simple or will people have to be trained to use it? Is it something that passive just sits there and works or do people have to actively engage with it in some way? We need to think through things like maintenance, um, 
the frequency of this. It's no good just thinking, hey, we've bought this now, it's going to work and that solve our problems. We need to be careful of the evidence that's available and is the evidence that is actually relevant to the circumstances of use. So buying, you know, an, an air cleaner that's been tested in a 20 cubic meter sealed chamber with no ventilation, is that actually going to work in your large open plan office, which is ventilated? I've mentioned already knock on impacts, secondary pollutants, comfort, noise, etc. And we also need to think about human response. So how do people respond to our use of technology? How is it going to influence behaviours? Do we get any compensatory behaviours? So, for example, people see the, that you've installed certain technologies, so they now think they don't have to wash their hands anymore or uh, they're, they're now safe. Really, we should be aware there are no magic bullets in here. And as engineers, our responsibility is to think through uh, these technologies from a, a very um, sort of um, evidence based approach and think through all of the different aspects that we might need to consider rather than just sort of looking for magic bullets. And then I also want to finish up by just thinking about the future. So we have seen an enormous response this year. We've seen an incredible response by science, by engineering, by the public, by the communities. Um, and it has it has mitigated the disease quite significantly, but it's come at a cost to us all. Our emergency response we've applied this year is really a stick in plaster solution. So we've done a lot of things like changing occupant densities. We've opened all the doors and windows to uh, give us ventilation. We've overridden certain systems and we've put in things like air cleaners in places. This is helping. This is important, but it's not sustainable. It's not a future um, environment that is effective because we are we're comp we're we're, we're um, we, we're comp um, compromising other aspects of this. So, for example, we're compromising our energy efficiency. We're compromising our comfort. So we need to think now about how we plan for the future. We need our infrastructure and systems to be resilient. I hate to say it, but for next time, because if you look at history, we've had in, in the past 20 years, we've had a SARS outbreak. We've had a MERS outbreak. We've had a flu pandemic and we've had uh, the current coronavirus pandemic. So four in 20 years tells us that this is not going to be our last one. We need to make sure we're more resilient and more prepared next time. We also more widely need to think about how we change our views about the built environment and putting health at the centre of it rather than just energy. So we now need to integrate health centred and health parameters in with our sustainability agenda. That might mean, for example, in a building, we need higher ventilation rates. So we'll then need to think about how we can enable that with low carbon heating so that we don't increase our carbon emissions. And all of this is going to require new thinking. So we're going to have to think differently about how we regulate. We're going to, have to revisit standards. We're going to have to innovate our technology. And I think it's really important that we bring this through training and education right from school days, but particularly our professional engineering um, training through our apprenticeships, through our degree programmes and through CPD so that we are flexible and aware of these challenges that our future uh, that, are, that we're currently dealing with and that we will need to address in our future. And I would like to thank you for listening and um, I hope this has been a useful presentation for you.